drives me to despair in the shadows Lord let me find you there into How's everybody? Good, you're here. Uh, we are in the midst of trying to set stuff up like we've never done before. And uh, these guys have been working overtime to try to help me. I had something in my mind that I want to do today, and we're going to do it one way or the other. Um, but I was trying to produce helps that would help you follow along with what I intend to do. Um, and so, um, as they always say, turn the phone off when you come in. Spam risk. Anybody ever get a spam risk? I have words for spam risk <laughs> that I probably shouldn't say now. Okay, let me turn this off. We're trying to do a little technology, and we're going to go back to basic teaching this morning. Welcome to our teaching session. The session this morning is going to be over Philippians chapter 2, uh, and you can take a look at it uh, with me. Philippians chapter 2, uh, we're going to start in verse 5, and you can see up here on the, on the left-hand side, and the guys are working on the other now, uh, that we are moving in that direction. And uh, I am thrilled of what they've been able to do, um, but it's not quite what we want, and it's not quite what we had hoped, but it's going to work for us, at least to a certain degree, making last-minute decisions and trying to get you to where you can see. But if you brought a Bible with you, you're in good shape. Did you bring a Bible with you? All right. Philippians chapter 2 and uh, we're not going to just read verses 5 through 8. We're going to read verses 5 through 11. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient uh, even unto the death of the cross. Uh, and then I want to go a little further, verses 9 through 11. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This passage is referred to as the kenosis of Christ. 
Uh, it really s means specifically the self-emptying of Christ. Um, it describes to us three major issues, three major themes. Number one, the command to have the mind of Christ. Number two, what that mind is. And number three, what is the result of the mind of Christ? So we're going to take a look at that this morning, but I'm not going to just teach what is here, even though I may have to ultimately move towards that. What I wanted to do and uh, what we were trying to establish for you this morning in the last uh, few hours, I'd felt led to try to do this, but I don't quite have the equipment set up, so you'll have to just bear with me. You got to love me even if I don't do it well. But it's my desire, it's my heart to not just teach the Word, but teach people how to study the Word. Because so many of us fail to equip ourselves in the simplicity of a process that would help us better understand the totality of the Scriptures. How do I, uh, how do I approach the Scripture? How do I learn from the Bible? It's so massive. It's such a huge it's such a huge book what's the best process for me to take not only this passage but any passage and find out what it says I'm the one that's reading it I have to figure it out it's one thing to come to church and have the preacher preach and he will have done his labor he will have done his work but it's my heartbeat that you sit down yourself with a process that you can easily embrace. Um, I have worked in education for over 30 years. I've taught in Bible colleges for over 30 years. I have two master degrees, one that was accepted by the world and one that's not. One is from an accredited institution and one is not. But I can tell you that the common Christian um, has the ability to study the scripture and being a believer, the, in, the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit lives in you. And you have the capacity to be guided and led into all truth. Brother Swigert doesn't have any degrees. He says he's got a me degree. And a me degree, you know, listen, if you get all the degrees in the world and you've got master's degrees and a Ph.D. and all that, your education can make you stupid. Because when you start depending upon the education that you get, uh, you put aside the me degree. And the me degree was what the disciples had. They were amazed that they were ignorant and unlearned men, but they took note that they had been come on somebody, with Jesus. And, and the power of the Holy Spirit can take someone that's never been through formal education and make them smart in the scriptures. So I'm here to tell you that as I lay out a simple process for you and on how you can attempt to study, and we study this passage and come to the conclusion of what Paul was saying, that as I do that, I just want you to know that you have the capacity, you have the capacity, there's a brand new word, that's from my me degree, you have the capacity, you have the ability, if you can read the Bible, if you can read, if you can read English, you can understand with the help of the Holy Spirit and a few simple tools um, that may take you a little while to master, but at the same point in time, you can start better discerning in your own Bible study, in your own reading, what it is that you could do, how to approach uh, the work so that you can get the most out of your Bible study. So I'm going to, as we study this passage this morning, what I'm going to start with is, at least we're going to attempt, and that's why the fellows, they worked all night, worked half the morning, and we're still trying to figure out. I worked through a projector up on a screen, but so when you take the screen on my computer and you run it into a TV, it's a little different. So we've been trying to figure that out, and we've got me degrees, and it's, it's only going so far. But uh, we're going to try to take a look at not just the passage, which we're going to study, which we're going to learn, which we're going to talk about. 
but we're going to also talk about how would we study this passage. We're going to talk about some simple steps, some simple processes that you at home can uh, incorporate in a passage, say, you want to learn, or something that you're reading in your Bible study, and all of a sudden it jumps off the page to you, and you know that the Lord is teaching you something, but you want to make sure you have it in the right content, you have it in the right context, you have the appropriate meaning, that you want to know what God is trying to say to you. Can I say amen to that? So today we're going to study this passage, we're going to learn it, it'll be the centerpiece of our study, but at the same time I'm going to try to incorporate um, the how-to of study, as well as the study itself. Everybody okay? And remember, we all have me degrees, and that's what we're counting on, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for this opportunity in this church, in this place, to be able to work towards the understanding of a passage. Father, as we discuss this this morning, as we look at this this morning, we're asking for your help. We're asking for the help of the Holy Spirit. We're asking for the true teacher and preacher to come. And Lord, help us make it easy for people to understand, for people to grasp, for people to be able to see that they are able in their own right to study your word and to gain wonderful treasures out of that which the word holds. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. Now, if you see me bending over my computer like this, it's because when I do the screen, the, my cursor gets so small, I have to have a microscope to see it. And uh, every now and, now and then, it, it helps me, and other times, it just disappears. And some of the things I'm going to put on the screen aren't necessarily going to be very large. Whenever you study um, a scripture, and you can't really see it very well, but that's as large as I can make it. Whenever you study a, a passage of Scripture, there are several things that you need to determine. Um, you need to know the history around the writing. The history around the writing includes the author. It includes the circumstances. Uh, why did the author write what he wrote? Who was he writing to? What was the timing? Uh, there are several things you'll need to know about the book that you're reading from. What kind of book is it? You know, there's different literature in the Bible. Uh, an epistle is different than a song. Okay, if you were reading a book on poetry and you were reading a letter from your best friend, you would approach it a little differently, wouldn't you? Well, the Psalms are poetry. They're songs. And there are groupings of songs within the scriptures that we look at. And so we have to know, am I reading a letter? Am I reading history? Am I reading poetry? Um, these are all important things that we should think about when we try to discern the meaning of scripture. It's called uh, historical content and literal content. Now, Paul, in our text this morning, is writing to the church at Philippi. Who can talk to me about the church at Philippi? Who knows anything about the church at Philippi? <laughs> you have a better me degree than you're showing me. Okay, let me help you. I'm sorry? Good. There we go. So now we've got the author. Paul is the author of the book, Philippians. What was going on in Paul's life um, when he wrote the book of Philippians? Huh? He was in jail. Philippians is one of Paul's four prison epistles. Philippians... Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. It's one of four prison epistles. It's about 62 to 65 A.D. Scholars disagree on it. But Paul has been in missions work um, since almost since he got saved. He's already completed three 
missionary journeys, and he goes back to Jerusalem, and he's arrested, and he winds up in Rome. You remember the book of Acts, how Paul goes back to Jerusalem, Acts 21, 22, how he's arrested, and he literally spends four years under the auspices of Rome, two years in Caesarea Philippi and two years in Rome. But while he's in Rome, uh, he has the time, and you never know why God does what he does, he has the time to sit down and write a letter. Now, anybody know why he wrote Philippians? Why did Paul write? I mean, he could have wrote to anybody. I'm sorry? Okay, part of it was problems. Paul would often write letters to correct situations in the church. And that was accurate. He would try to uh, bring instruction to areas where certain churches were struggling. Um, and there is that in Philippians. We're going to see a part of it in our passage because in the things that he says about Christ, he didn't just decide to all of a sudden one day go, whoop, I want to write about Christ. There was a reason behind it. There was a reason why he wrote what he wrote. The church at Philippi, anybody remember how that church was established? Anybody ever read Acts 16? Okay, Acts 16. You're just, I know you're, I know what it is, you're shy. So I'm gonna help you a little bit. But this is this is teaching. So this is a classroom. So if you got an answer, throw that hand up. And if you have a question, throw that hand up because uh, if you have a question, then someone else has a question too. Acts 16. Paul is traveling on his second missionary journey, and he starts going off towards Ephesus, and the Holy Ghost says, no, you can't go there. So he scoots off into another direction, and the, up into Bithynia, northern Galatia, and the Holy Spirit says, no, you can't go there either. So he goes over to Troas, and he's standing there thinking, where in the world am I supposed to go? And he goes to sleep one night at Troas, and in the midst of his sleep, he has a vision, and he has a vision of a man that's saying, come over here and help us. So all of a sudden, Paul knows where to go. Let me tell you something. Your life can be a series of divine instructions. And if you'll seek the face of God, as we talked about last night, sometimes you go this way, and you, you meant well, and you thought you had, but you start going, and the Holy Ghost is faithful to say, no, I don't want you over there. And then you'll try another route, and you, no, I don't want you over there. Well, I wish you'd have just given me the vision in the first place, but uh, you know why or what, I, don't, I can't tell you why God instructs you the way that he does. Am I talking to anybody besides me this morning? So I get to Troas, and Paul has the Macedonian call. You remember now? And he travels across the sea, and he lands in uh, an arena um, on the shores and heads toward the major city, the first major city uh, in, 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 in what is now Europe, if you will, Asia Minor. Uh, is out, is, he's left Asia Minor. He's gone into Europe. The fact that God directed him into Europe is why you and I are Christian today. So his, his Macedonian call broke out into Christianity in England, ultimately Christianity in America. Come over and help us. So he lands in Philippi, and Paul's process of working was always to try to locate the Jew. Why would he try to locate the Jews? He would try to win them over, but what was special about the Jewish community no matter where they were in the world? They were first, but why were they first? Well, they were God's children, chosen people, but what did he give them that was unique to the rest of the world? He gave them the Scriptures. So wherever, wherever the Jews were, Paul would go there first because everything Paul taught in the New Covenant was 
ensconced in the old. And he took the old that were in the scriptures that the Jews would have. They would normally form a synagogue in a city. Or they, if they didn't have a synagogue, a place to meet that was like our church, they would meet down by a river. And they did that because the river was a type of life. And they would have the scriptures and the Jew would discuss the scriptures. Well, Paul would come along and he would quote Isaiah 53 and tell them what it meant. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who's him? Oh, I've got good news. The Messiah has come. The promised one has come. The one Isaiah was talking about. And his name is Jesus. And so from that very base, he would begin to teach and preach. And he found a group of people down by the river in Philippi. This is all in Acts 16. And he began to preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they heard it. And they got saved. And the person that was most prominent was a lady by the name of Lydia, who was a businesswoman. And she said, you guys got to just come stay at my house. And so the first church in Philippi, the church that started in Philippi was started by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey and was housed in the house of a female, Lydia, and it's believed that Lydia would have been the first bishop over the church of Philippi. Now, those of you that struggle with women being preachers, you probably just have to keep reading the Scripture. Because in Philippians chapter 4, we're going to find out that two women in this church, Iodas and Sintiche, are squabbling. Imagine that. Two women in church squabbling. Don't know where that ever came from. And Paul has to deal with it. But it's not just women who squabble in church. Come on, somebody. Uh, sometimes disagreements occur, and we need to resolve them. So Paul gets started in the church at Philippi, and he's preaching the gospel, and he starts marching through the streets of Philippi. Now, one of the things that we would learn if we studied about the book of Philippians uh, before we studied our passage is because we would find out that Philippi was a retirement for city for Roman generals. There wasn't much of a Jewish contingency there. That's why there was no synagogue. They met down by the river. They were just a small group of Jews there. But Paul would always start with the Jews first because they had the Scripture. He didn't have to explain the Scripture to them. He could tell them what the Scripture they already had meant, which if you go to a Gentile, he doesn't have the Bible. He doesn't have the Scriptures. You just start with nothing. So he would go there first and offer the gospel to them first. And he's preaching now in, to Jew and Gentile and all the retired men uh, there in Philippi. And guess what happens? There's this demon-possessed woman that's following him. Now, did you know that demons can sometimes give a partial truth? Demons will fool you because they'll tell you the, uh, the truth at the first and then switch the order to error. And this lady was demon-possessed, and she followed him throughout the city and screamed out, This man will show us the way of salvation. Now, it's funny that most preachers wouldn't notice that she's demon-possessed as long as she was talking good about him. Pastor, not everybody in here. No, I won't go there. But <laughs> Paul turned right around and said, I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus. And what happened? That demon that was moving in her left, but there was a problem because some of the rich businessmen, the sporting agents, the guys with the booking betting companies, had hired this woman because she could foretell which gladiator was going to win in the arena the next day. Imagine a guy on sports books that could 
that had somebody that could tell them who really was going to win on Sunday. Was Arkansas actually finally going to beat LSU? I mean, I, who knows? Uh, oh, whoops. Suey, suey. Um, so what if somebody could tell you that, right? Um, what if someone could tell you, and, and you control the betting market, and then all of a sudden some guy who's preaching something you don't really care to hear and you don't want to know about destroys the one element that you had for success? And how are they going to feel about that? How did they feel about that? They got mad. They got upset. They weren't upset about the gospel. They were upset about the fact that they lost their demon-possessed woman. She's now free and saved, born again, able to live for God, but the world is mad because she's no longer demon-possessed and able to help them. That's making sense, doesn't it? And the world gets all upset with Paul and his, and his traveling companion Silas, beats them and puts them in jail. Anybody remember now about Philippi? And it was at midnight where Paul and Silas were singing praises unto the Lord. I said last night, God does some of his best work in jail. Singing praises unto the Lord. And all of a sudden the earth quakes. And the prisoners are all set free. And the guard who loses his life if one prisoner leaves the prison house comes rushing in and is ready to commit suicide because he knows if the chains are all off the prisoners and the doors are open, those prisoners are gone. And Paul yells out, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. See, when God opens up the doors, he doesn't destroy people. He saves people. And Paul and Silas led that man, that jailer, to the Lord. He and his family were saved. And the next day, the people that had charged them illegally and beaten them. You don't beat a Roman citizen, which Paul was from his birth. That was totally illegal. And when they found out that Paul was a Roman citizen, they went, whoops. And I love Paul, and, and this is just, I'm just giving you the story you could have read yourself in the book of Acts, Acts 16. I love Paul uh, because now he's sitting in jail, and uh, the jailer comes in and he says, well, they say you can go. Paul said, I'm not going. You tell them to come here and tell me I'm leaving. They beat a Roman. You tell them I want to talk to those guys. He made him come there and release him. And he did that for a purpose so that the church that was now founded in Philippi would not be bothered by the world because the world, he had that trump card in his hand, which was, you beat a Roman, you give my church problems, I'm going to take this to Rome, which would be big problems. So it's kind of a smart thing to do. But Paul and Silas leave and go to Berea almost immediately. But here's the power of the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. When the Holy Spirit moves in and takes up residence within a believer, and he does in every single believer, the moment you're born again, the Holy Spirit, not just a piece of him, not just a part of him, comes inside to live and begins to do the conforming work that God intends him to do. That's why me as a drunk, as a drug addict, the night after I got saved was in love with the Bible because I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's why the desires of my heart began to change because the moment you're born again, the Holy Spirit's presence starts to teach, starts to guide, starts to lead, and something in you says, don't do that. Yeah, you can do that. Don't go there. Yeah, you can. And it all changes, but I'm not I'm not abiding by somebody's rules. I'm actually following the internal truth that the Holy Spirit brings. He guides me into all truth. Now, this is not the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is the power of God, according to classic Pentecostals, which I am, that comes at a time after salvation, any time after salvation. It doesn't save you but it empowers you for service. 
gives you the opportunity to do for God whatever God has for you. And while I do believe that everyone that's baptized with the Holy Spirit speak in tongues, the purpose of the baptism for you might be different in some aspects than it is for me because I'm called to preach. Not everybody that's baptized with the Holy Spirit is called to preach, but everybody that's baptized with the Holy Spirit that's a Christian is called to share the gospel. So the power and the gifts of the Spirit can come in. So Paul initiates salvation. He's not there very long, and he leaves. So now you know how the church in Philippi began. And when you read the book of Philippians, you have to realize this, that as Paul begins his letter to the church at Philippi, he is drawing from an experience with this church that has been maintained. It's now, as he writes Philippi, it's now about 10 years later. But if we read the book, which if you want to find out what a passage says or what a passage means, you have to read the book. And you have to think about what it is. Oftentimes before we study a, a, book, a passage, we're called upon to read a, a major section of the book or maybe the whole book. But if you read the book of Philippians, you're going to find something unique that's really special. And that's that this church in the mind and heart of Paul is someone that he loves. The church is a group that he just really cares about. Uh, the number of personal pronouns, the me, the I, how I feel about you, is expressed in his letter over and over and over and over and over again. So he's got this close relationship with them. And he writes at the very first and he tells them, you know, you're the one group that has supported me since the day that I met you. Amen. He's an itinerant preacher. He's traveling around the country and this particular group has always supported him. But for a short period of time, it seems as we read through the book, that he has been separated from them. Either they couldn't find them or their finances uh, didn't go very well. Their financial situation wasn't very good. And so they began to de delay their normal giving to him. For some reason, we're not told. But when he got to Rome, the Bible tells, tells us in the book of Acts that those who had incarcerated gave him his own house, gave him his own address. And somehow the church at Philippi found out where he was, and the church at Philippi says, we're going to send to him again an offering to make sure that his needs are met. The church at Philippi could very well have been a very rich church because uh, the one that founded it was Lydia, who was a very wealthy businesswoman. So providing that those businesses were maintained over a period of time, it was a church that had wealth that they could share. Not every church can share. But if you have the capacity to share, you can. And so the fact that Lydia is a businesswoman that goes around the world and that first church is in her house, then there's every reason to believe that the support that the Apostle Paul came or gave was a very wonderful, uh, wonderfully supplied church. They had the funds to send. That's a blessing. So one of the purposes for Paul's writing to the church at Philippi was to thank them for the offering. Did you know that? He's thanking them for the offering, and that after a period of time of stoppage, they were able to come back together again and work towards um, a relationship. In the first chapter of Philippians, there's my little courser, where did it go? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Courser, courser, where'd you go? There you are. So when Paul writes to the church at Philippi, 
he is, first of all, going to explain to him, to them, how his incarceration has furthered the gospel. Now, that's interesting. He wants them to know that, look, don't feel sorry for me in jail because what's happening to me is furthering the gospel. It's actually furthering the gospel. But when it comes down to the area of our text, he has switched at the end of chapter 1 to another subject. And let me see if I can, and again, I apologize for fighting through all this. And he begins to talk to them on the subject of Christian conduct. If you want to study the scripture, you have to know what comes before your passage and what comes after your passage. In fact, if you're going to study, you want to see that your passage is a singular event. Most times, um, those of us that paid attention in fifth grade English, uh, Shane, you might be able to help me here, but uh, those of us that paid attention in, in English in school learned that there was a literal portion of a writing that holds one main idea. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, a paragraph holds one main idea, doesn't it? So if you want to study the Bible out, you need to probably study it out in paragraphs. And paragraphs begin a discussion and end a discussion. So anytime that you have heard me preach, anytime that you have heard me teach, I have always gone into uh, the scriptures and tried to ascertain where one idea stopped and another idea started. Now, over the years, what I found is that there has been work done already, I don't have to figure it out, uh, that tells me where, what scholarship believes is a passage. Now, I was going to show it to you on the screen, but I really don't, uh, I can't because it, it, it's too small, you wouldn't be able to see it. But one of the tools, and I'll leave it up here when we go on break, that you might want to look at is called the Open Bible. Because what, each, what it does is that in the open Bible, this particular ver version of it, um, in every book of the Bible, it gives you the background of the Bible. It gives you the background of the book. It gives you the background of the author. It gives you the circumstances as to why he wrote what he wrote. So uh, in this one tool, and I give it to all of my students who come in for preaching class, not that they're all preachers, but all of them need to be able to break down the scriptures in order uh, to understand the passage so they can preach it. Philippians here in the open Bible, here's your explanation of the things we've just covered. It tells you in a single volume uh, what is there. It also breaks down the book in segments, major topics. Um, you've run across this, I'm sure, uh, as you've learned the book of Romans. Romans is divided up into five major segments. Uh, the first segment, all men are guilty before God. The second segment is justification. Third segment is sanctification. Right, so every book of the Bible, in this, in this case, scholars have already told you, these are what you're going to find in each section. In this particular work, it tells us that in chapter 1, the major thought is Paul talking about the account of his circumstances. Number 2, Paul is talking about, in chapter 2, the mind of Christ. So it gives divisions, whether they run by chapter or by chapter. But then when you get to the, the, the text itself, what it does is that it divides every single every single piece of Scripture into paragraphs. So guess what? I don't have to try to figure out where the paragraphs are. It's already been decided for me. Now, I have a me degree, so I can go before what they say and even after if they say, but I promise you, if you've ever heard me preach, it's because I took that paragraph and I studied it. 
I studied it because a paragraph is supposed to have one major thought. And when I come to preach, I don't come to preach the whole Bible. I want to preach one major idea. Last night I preached, call unto me. That was the major idea that I pulled out of the paragraph of Jeremiah 33, 1 through 9. I study the paragraph. And out of that paragraph, I find and search for the subject that God wants me to preach, that God wants me to see. As a believer, then, if I find the paragraph and I read it, and you can do it with a me degree. Me degree means you and the Holy Ghost. You can begin to take a look at the uh, passage and say, okay, this is the reason. But before you decide what the reason is, you should know who Paul is writing to. You should know why he's writing the letter. And you should maybe have a good idea of what he's been talking about before your passage and what he talks about after your passage. Because oftentimes, even though the paragraphs are different, that information is important. And in our text, that's important. Are you okay? Are you, yeah. you, you following what I'm trying to give you today? All right. So in, we can see that Paul talks about in chapter 1 all of these issues. But when he comes to chapter 1 leading up to our paragraph in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, he starts talking to them about Christian conduct. And here's where it changes from his circumstances to him. And he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. What does it mean? What does the word conversation mean? Lifestyle. So Paul is saying, let your lifestyle reflect the gospel. Okay, so let me ask this question. If you've got a letter from your pastor, and he says to you in the letter, man, be sure that your lifestyle reflects the gospel. What might be happening? Yeah, you know, if I write a letter and say, pastor, I've heard some things about your people, they need to start reflecting the gospel. Ah, so Paul is start, talk, starting to talk to Philippi, as you said, about a, a problem that he kind of knows a little bit about. You need to reflect the gospel. Yes. Is it what? Yes, exactly what it is. She said, is it, is it, fruit, is it fruit? Yes, exactly. It's the expression of Christ living in you. That's what your community needs to see. They need to see Christ through you. And so Paul, as he's writing to the church, evidently he's got, you know, people, in those days the mailman didn't show up at your address. There was a messenger that came from the church uh, that actually would not only give that letter to him and the offering to him, uh, and Epaphras is the man that, that was involved with this, Epaphras or Epaphroditus. He's the one that brought the letter, and he talks about the church. So Paul hears about the church, and he says, look, there's something I want you guys to be aware of. You need to display the gospel of Christ, whether I'm there or not. And verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. So what's an adversary? An enemy. And why would you be terrified by an enemy? Because what? He's out to destroy you. So evidently we find two things out as we read the text. That's happening in the church at Philippi. There needs to be a little more fruit exhibited by the believers and they need to operate free from fear from the opposition that has come against them. So Paul is talking to them about freedom from adversaries and freedom from uh, a conduct that isn't what they should be. Everybody with me? We're, we're moving up towards our paragraph now. Are, are, you, are you getting it? He's writing back to the church, and he says what he says. Um, and I got to work here just a second. It's tiny. 
Tiny Tim is a giant compared to this. Then he says, after the don't be terrified by your adver- adversaries and be sure of your Christian conduct, then he says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any boil, bowels and mercies, and if there is a fulfilled condition, so it could be translated literally sense. Since there is consolation or comfort in Christ, since there is a comfort of love, since there is fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, and that refers to the very heart of God being expressed in love towards you, he says, and fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Why would he say that? Because they might not be in one accord and one mind. He's writing to a church that he loves. So he's not, he's not slashing out with a whip, is he? He says to them, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Don't Work in the church to bring yourself up to a position. Don't work in the church to surpass somebody else. Don't work in the church just so they'll know your name and know what you can do. Whatever you do, don't argue about what you're doing. Don't be jealous about what other people get to do that you don't get to do. Oh, boy, this is, this is good stuff. <laughs> he says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Be more concerned about somebody else's situation. So as we're, you see what we're doing, we're, we're, we went wide with the book and the circumstances. Now we understand the circumstances and we're looking at the letter and we're narrowing it down to where we're actually going to study this. But now we know that Paul is addressing a church that he loves. He's doing it in kindness, but he's saying, you've got to be careful as to how you live. You've got to be careful as to how you approach your life. You have to be careful as to how you uh, treat one one another because your adversaries are watching. The people in the world that oppose you are looking for a reason to discount your faith in Christ. They are looking for a reason to say to the rest of your community, oh, Faith Worship Center, they just... They want a reason to discount your faith. And Paul says the greatest thing that we can do uh, relative to our adversaries, don't be afraid of them, but make sure that your conduct towards everyone else in the church is outstandingly like the conduct of Christ toward you. Whew! Well, I didn't know it was all this. Yeah, right, yeah. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on that. But in other words, pay more attention to your neighbor and what he needs than you yourself. I lost that. Anybody else feeling the need to head toward the altar real quick? (laughs) Besides me? So by studying the content, the literal content of the verses before our passage... And then determining the passage itself, um, now we're going to come to our passage, and when we do, it will explain itself based on the fact that you have taken the time to look at what comes before. Don't be terrified by your adversaries. Watch out in regard to how you live Make sure that your conduct is what it needs to be in Christ. And then he says this. Let this mind be in you. 
which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, when we study a passage, we need to look for major divisions again of thought, and this is a major emphasis. This is a thesis statement. It's a thesis sentence. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So let's slow down just a minute and talk about this. What is he concerned about? He's concerned about how we look to the rest of the world. What's he concerned about? He's concerned about our lifestyle, our conversation, literally exhibiting Christ to the rest of the world. He's concerned about how we treat one another because that displays or fails to display the Christ that we say we serve. I've been embarrassed at a few restaurants by Christians who treat waitresses like an unwanted stepchild. Do you think that when they don't leave a tip but they leave a gospel track that she's going to appreciate it much? Leave a big tip and underneath it leave the track. What's the point? If your conversation, if your lifestyle isn't exhibiting at all times the nature of your heart that God has changed, then you're failing to preach the gospel. Everywhere you go, every situation you encounter, at work, at home, all of it is a witness to the one you call Savior. Anybody else besides me struggle at times, especially when I've been having a bad day? We don't have bad days in Arkansas? <laughs> Something's on my mind. The wife sold my boat. <laughs> the dog ate the television clicker. Joseph pushed my motorcycle through the back wall, learning to drive. He really did. He did do that. <laughs> Those size 14 shoes couldn't determine what was the brake and which was the accelerator. <laughs> Stop, Joseph. Stop, Joseph. <laughs> Push that 2007 Ultra Classic Harley Davidson motorcycle right through the back wall of the carport. Are you ready to exhibit Christ then? <laughs> Joseph, I'm going to introduce you to the suffering of Christ. <laughs> he felt so bad, I was no way I was going to beat him up. Brother Swigert says I lied about it, but it didn't. But how we handle circumstances out in public and even in private, you know, one of the things about raising a successful Christian family is the need to be a Christian in your home. All of my children battled living for God as they went into their teenage years. The devil works overtime. Um, but every single one of them, starting with Joy, who now pastors with her husband in Largo, Florida, and... Grace and Joseph and Rachel have all come to me and said, Dad, it wasn't what you said. It was how you and Mom lived. It wasn't that you forced us to do Bible study. We really didn't do a lot of that in my home. We didn't sit down and because we were I we were in church constantly. We were in services constantly. But, it was, but it's what I was at home that they saw that appealed to them. It was what I was like on the job. It was how I handled difficulties. And was I perfect? No. But when I wasn't, when I didn't do it right or I didn't do it right, I came back to them. I said, I'm sorry. I didn't. You know, it's hard to apologize to your kid. But you need to maybe do it sometimes if you've been wrong. 
if you didn't handle a situation well because it shows it shows a need to handle things right. And when they do something wrong with their friends or their family, they'll remember what they saw. So what we do with what we have is important. And Paul now comes to us and says, if you really want to exhibit Christianity and you want to be a witness to your community, then let this mind, you see it, be in you. It wasn't just what the scholars call the kenosis, the self-emptying of Christ. That's really not the emphasis of the passage. The emphasis of the passage is what Paul wants the church at Philippi to be like. So he's going to choose the best example that has ever existed and say, let this mind be in you. What does that mean? Yeah, be like Christ. All right. What what does he mean by the word mind? See, when we study the Bible, we sometimes have to slow down and, and start meditating and thinking about the word mind. And, and if you have a good Bible dictionary or you have a good lexicon or you have tools that can show you what the original language uh, means, uh, that's wonderful. But what does it mean to let this mind be in you? What is the mind? Okay, it's, it is the intellect, but let this mind be in you. Can you match the intellect of Christ? Uh, yeah, so I'm probably not as smart as him, but it also includes really, when we start talking about the mind, several good word-for-word translations gives us this idea, let this attitude be your attitude, the way that you think, the way that you view yourself. Look at yourself and respond to the situations around you in the same way that Jesus did. If you want to show your adversaries that you're not afraid of them, and you want to show the world that what you have is a reality, let This mind be in you. And and when we study the verbiage of this word, it's it's not a suggestion. In the Greek, it is an imperative, which is a, a command. It's not like, oh, well, if you don't want to, you don't have to. It's Paul. Guys, let this, let it happen. This needs to be so. Let the mind, the attitude that Christ had towards other people be in you. Because some of the problems that we have is we're having a few squabbles in our church. Some people aren't getting along with other people in our church. We might need to fix some relationships in the church because if we can't fix them by the grace of God in the church, what we reflect to our adversaries in the world is not going to be what God wants us to be. And why would Portia and Pocahontas and uh, uh, Walnut Ridge and all the people in this area want to come and be with a group of people that hate each other, that dislike each other, that gossip about each other, that put each other down that have fried preacher every Sunday afternoon over in Pocahontas somewhere and they listen to that, why would they want to be a part of what you have? Oh, we love Jesus, but we hate each other. (laughs) Gossip, 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 gossip. Who do you think hears that? Who do, you think, who do you think is going to be impacted by that? The people in your community. And to resolve that, Paul says, 
Let, let this mind, let the attitude that Jesus had, let it be your mind. Let it be the way you think. Let it be the way that you respond to people. See, now, now you understand why he's saying it? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Let this mind be in you. Now, we got to take a break, but let me, let me say this to you. Now you know why you need the message of the cross. Because, honey, your mind ain't what it's supposed to be, and I'm in line behind you. Let this mind, let this mind, church at Philippi, I love you, but let the, the, you need to be careful because people are watching. You need to be careful because your community is glancing at you. They're, they're wondering, do I really want to, want to belong to the Christ that's exhibited to me by Faith Worship Center in my community? When I go to the feed and grain, do I act like I'm a Christian? When I'm out doing the work and it's been, been hot and there's been no rain and the crops aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, do I go into the place I sell my crop and talk in a language that's exhibiting Christ? Come on, somebody help me in here. Let this mind be in you. Now, uh, that's a command but the message of the cross, again, says, I'm not something, and I need the grace of God to formulate, to change me. The command is let this mind, so we have the mind of Christ, but the problem is we're not completely conformed to that, and this is where your message of the cross, see, when you know what you're not, and you know what you're supposed to be, as a Christian, you can cry out to God and say, Lord, help. I can't. You can. Change me. Give me this same attitude. Give me the mind that Christ had so that I can display Christianity in my environment, in my home, in my relationship with other people because the world is watching. Okay, chew on that for a few minutes as we go take a donut in as well. And when we come back, we're going to move into the second part of this passage. Let this mind be in you. That's the command. But then we're going to take a really close look at what that means. By what, does, what, what attitudes did Christ have? Because if I'm going to have his mind and his way of thinking, then my attitude needs to be what I find his to be. Everybody glad you came to Bible study this morning? Yeah. All right, good. Listen, we'll take a little break. Um, uh, seven minutes after 11. Uh, I'm giving you 10 minutes. I know you'll take 15, but we've got to be done by 12. So we want to work through this passage and look at the two other major segments. There's going to be, I, am I right? There's, there's, they said donuts across the hall, coffee and what have you. Go help yourself. Use the restrooms. Uh, I believe there'll be somebody to wait on you if you want some of the product that I brought. But we're going to take a break, and we'll be back at 20 after.